Hello and welcome to the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley's program for this week. My name is Mitty Chang. I am the vice president of this Rotary E-Club and also one of the past presidents. Um, it's an honor to welcome to you all to our program. Um, this week we have Bob Blacker, um, who will be sharing with us some information about his project, uh, Right to Read. But before then, um, let's introduce our members on the call. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Cecilia Babkirk. Cecilia, if you just wave to everyone. <laughs> Cecilia is our member based in um, the Cupertino area of the Silicon Valley in California. Uh, and she runs her own um, financial uh, brokerage real estate company. I'm probably not getting that 100% accurate, but she does a lot of great things. Um, Cecilia, would you like to follow up really quick with your own intro there? Sure. I'm a mortgage advisor with Opus Advisors, which is a division of Flagstar Bank. But my real work that I probably spend way more time I'm the um, District Grants Subcommittee Chair for District 5170, and I manage all of the humanitarian grants, which are about a million and a half to two million dollars each year. Uh, we've got lots of uh, places up here in British Columbia you can come to. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Good to have you with us, Cecilia. Is that the um, <laughs> We also have on the call um, our member, Roger Plessit. Roger is our program chair for this Rotary year, and he's based up in Canada in Kamloops. Roger is a lawyer by trade. Um, Roger, I'm going to pass it over to you for a quick self-introduction as well. Yeah, we're having a beautiful day today in Kamloops, British Columbia. Not too hot, just, uh, just uh, we have, uh, contrary to a lot of opinion, once you pass the 49th parallel, it tends to be really beautiful in the spring, summer, and fall. As uh, you can see with Bob uh, looking out there on the, uh, in his screen, just how nice of a location he is presently in, in uh, in British Columbia, because it is a beautiful province. Awesome. Roger, it's always good to have you on the call. Uh, and mm -hmm. it's my honor to introduce our guest speaker for this week. Um, I've been in Rotary for, for uh, going on uh, 22 years. Uh, joined when I was with the New Westminster Police Force. Wanted to give back to my community, and I thought what a way to do it would be join Rotary, which I did and I never looked back. Uh, in 2000, I retired from the police department as a senior manager and got really moving with Rotary. And just before that, I was a, um, a aide-de-camp uh, to the Lieutenant Governor of British Columbia. And I have been, I, I now no longer an aide de camp in 22 years as one and five different uh, lieutenant governors. So where this all came about um, was with uh, the then lieutenant governor in British Columbia in, in uh, 2007, and it was a year by year as district governor. Mine was in 2008, 2009. And uh, I was in the back of a car with and I was in the front and my, my lieutenant governor was in the back and he was our very first um, Aboriginal lieutenant governor in British Columbia. And he asked me this magic question, what's Rotary doing about books? And I told him, we're doing great. We're going to Africa, Southeast Asia, all around the world, doing a great job. Our libraries are second to none, lots of books, doing a damn good job. But then he asked me this other question, which really, really he, uh, stumped me a bit. And he said, oh, that's great. what do you do in your own backyard? I couldn't answer him, <laughs> not a chance. So I looked at him, I said, your honor, I wouldn't have a clue, but I'm gonna find out. And that very start of what this project's all about. And what it's all about is getting libraries and learning centers into remote Aboriginal indigenous communities throughout British Columbia. And we started off way back in 2007. He said to me, Bob, 
I would like you to uh, see what Rotary can do. I'll go and talk to all the chiefs and uh, we'll get back together and see what we can do. Well, the good thing about it, I had been in Rotary for some time now, seven years, and I had eight, nine years, and I had been to on quite a few, um, uh, quite a few uh, international projects. And I knew from that that with the template that you have with international projects, that would probably suit us how we were going to with our remote communities. And when I'm talking about remote communities, I'll tell you this. I'm going up to a, a, a small community up the coast of British Columbia. It's called Clem 2. Clem 2, I have to fly up to poor, uh, Prince Rupert, which is right on the Alaska-British Columbia border. And it's about a two and a half hour, well, two and a quarter hour flight from Vancouver. Then we're going to get on, uh, my team and I, getting uh, three of us, are going to get on a Coast Guard cutter that is going to take us down to Clem 2, 14 hour trip down there and down back and back. And this is the type of thing that we go into. I got one community that I go into. The only way we can get into is by float plane uh, or by boat. That's it. And so we, we have some interesting little trips. So that's one of the sort of things we had to start looking at. How in the heck are we going to get uh, libraries into these communities given their remote uh, remoteness throughout British Columbia? So we had to do a lot of planning in the beginning. And the other uh, things that I had to confront was, well, I need help with this because it, you know, one person cannot do it, as we all know. And, and that started uh, the start of the Right to Read team. Um, we started off with just three of us, four of us. Now we've got 20. And what we did is that I had some folks that I met at my district conference and uh, some young Rotarians heard about what we're intending to do with uh, Right to Read about going to remote uh, villages and getting the books in there. And uh, one of the young ladies come up to me and she said, look, I really would like you to come up to my community. And that was up in, uh, near, uh, You'll know this, Williams Lake, and uh, uh, Williams Lake is in the center, uh, not the center of British Columbia, but it's just west of, of where Rogers in, in Kamloops. And so um, we had a community uh, in the Shokotan area, which is a, a part of this particular uh, southwest of uh, Williams Lake. And uh, we went to a community there who were desperately looking for something like that. They were a very poor community. They were always on the bottom of the list to receive something. And so we said, okay, that is the first library we're gonna do. And that's our first test. But we had run into some really interesting scenarios. Um, where are we gonna put this library? What is it gonna look like? Uh, libraries have got books and shelves. Where are we going to get those? Um, and so it became a part of, well, where are we going to get the money from? Because these things cost a bit of money. <laughs> so I, I started asking some of my, my district governor friends that, that I met up, Eddie, because you've been there, your, I think the year after I left there as the, the um, registrar. And uh, uh, we start, I started, I talked to one of them, I said, Gary, do you know somebody in your district that may have something to do with um, trailers? He says, oh, uh, I think I do. Um, I think he's got something to do with them, but give him a call. His name is David Taft. Here's his number. So I give him a call. Well, David Taft was the president and owner of Britco. Britco had built all of the modules that were used at the 2010 Olympics. So I said to him, this is what we're doing. Can you help us out? He said, sure. We're getting a whole bunch of these modules back from Whistler that were used at the Olympics and we can help you make them into a library. And all of a sudden we had the makings of something that could be really good. But then the next question for me was, well, how much? 
And you know Rotary's price, free 99. I always go by that. And it works. You know that. So I, I said to David, what's it going to cost me? He said, ah, Bob, you know, they're about twenty five to $30,000. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, how am I going to get that? Then he said, 17000 And even that, I was still thinking, what the heck am I going to do? So we said, okay. He said, that's all right, Bob. We'll get the module for you, and we'll start fixing it up. And we can talk about the price later on. So like he said to me, we can talk about it later on. So I didn't say a dang word. And up at, uh, the, uh, my girl up at uh, Wyndham's Lake, they got volunteers that come down, pick up the module, take it up there, plant it down next to the band office on this, in this community. And by God, here we had, we had our library. Threw a whole bunch of, <coughs> excuse me, books into the shelves. And we, said, we looked at it and we said, that looks really nice. But we didn't really do what we do now, and that is categorize, sort the books out, and get them like a library, and very much like a library. And that wasn't done until I met these four wonderful former librarians, and these four wonderful women who um, said to me, what are you doing? And I told them, and they said, well, we can help you. And when people say that, what do we do in Rotary? We say, come on, we need all the help we can get. So the women were able to, then we were able to start getting our libraries looking like libraries and working as such. And what we said to the communities were, is this, we'll get you a building. We'll get you the books. But what you need to do for us is get the land, uh, get the uh, infrastructure in there, like uh, power, water, et cetera. And also somebody, <coughs> excuse me, to look after the books. Well, um, we were able to do that. But funny thing happened uh, when we f opened our very first library, the owner, David Tapp, came up. And he wasn't supposed to, but he did for the opening. And so we were opening it with the lieutenant governor. And right after it, he said to me, Bob, I've decided we're going to give you that module you can't call the trailer you're gonna to have to call the module i said to him mate i'll call it anything you want and he said it's it'll cost you nothing well that one module turned out to be 14 and a donation to us well in excess of a half a million dollars that got us going that got us to a point where we could go to communities and sit down with them and look at what we could do to help them out. Now, our First Nation community um, in British Columbia and, and in Canada, if you ask me in 2007, my knowledge of Indigenous peoples in Canada, I would have had a very hard time trying to talk to you because we in Canada, <coughs> Excuse me. It's funny. I, I I don't know why, but this is what I have found in my own personal experience. I'll talk to many people, and uh, they'll sort of gloss over it. I can't explain what it is, but uh, dealing with First Nation is not a high priority, and I started to see it. And what I was seeing when I was going into these communities was a third world country in their own backyard. And I couldn't believe that because I was a firm believer that, and I was, as a police officer, was arresting drunken Indians and Indians that, that's the way we said it, um, and not First Nation, we say Indians, that were, or they're high on drugs. And I didn't really pay attention to what caused that. And a lot of the cause that I, my own personal opinion, is that, um, the control by the Canadian government <coughs> over the years with the various acts they have, well, the worst one I think is the Indian Act. And the worst thing that ever happened to Aboriginal folks is the Indian residential schools 
and that really, really affected these communities. I keep seeing it every community I go into. Um, I, it, it's extremely sad. Uh, we now, with the communities we've gone into, and we now will have 20 communities before the end of the year we've, they've done this with. Having uh, library learning centers now, I'll tell you more about in a minute, uh, in their communities that we're starting to see something happening. We're starting to see these communities really, uh, their self-esteem is starting to become evident and proud of what they're doing and saying to us, you know, we can do this. And why I'm saying we can do this is that we've got to a stage now that we're doing something that nobody else has ever even tried in Canada. And who does start doing that? Well, it's Rotary. We're the only ones in Canada that are doing what we're doing and recognizing our Aboriginal Indigenous peoples for what has happened to them and, and getting with them and not saying we're helping them, we're working with them to make their lives somewhat better because I will get the argument thrown at me all the time. What about that $8 billion that the government gives them? What about those chiefs who get away with all this money that they have and their own people have nothing? And you know, uh, a lot of that is right. And uh, those chiefs are being dealt with. The one thing I found with all of the communities we've been into and my team has, um, we haven't seen that. We've seen more of a caring community along with their leaders making the best they can with what they've got and they've got nothing square root of nothing so what we've done when we started putting in libraries we found that there was a yearning for learning that many of the folks that were in the community were adults now wanted to get their grade 12 they only had grade 5 or grade 6 education they wanted to get grade 12 so what we started to do is to supply the connectivity to the community, which we knew we could do. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and that we could also uh, um, help them out with many areas or work with them in many areas. So what we said, look, we'll get you the computers. We can get the connectivity and we'll get the computers and the they would they wanted it's interesting video conferencing capabilities with that you need fiber optic you need pretty damn good connectivity hundred up hundred down and the thing is in remote areas of british columbia fiber optic is not a not a hope and not a hope and heck uh some of them have got uh many of our communities are fiber optic some of them are microwave and the worst ones that we can't get any microwave or we can't get fiber optic then a satellite which is not that that super great so uh, we've been able to start that program of getting them on their learning and that is starting to make uh, get us more progress and so our libraries have turned into a learning so the learning center really have a, has a library within it. But a year and a half ago, um, Britco said to us, Bob, we're running out of trailers, modules. We can't give you any more. So we had to figure out, well, what in the heck are we going to do? Either we're going to have to build some or we have to try and get it into existing buildings. And when we go into community, we always look at saying first to them, well, what do you got there that we could put the, in, in, for a building that we could put something like this? And to tell you the truth, nine times out of 10, they got nothing because their bands, band offices are just deplorable. So we decided that with our and then design team, which you go into our website, righttoreadbc.com, you'll see in there the teams. And then each of the teams you'll see design team, a librarian, LRT, library response team, our building team. So you'll go in there and you'll see what we're, how we've 
sort of split each of the, uh, the group of us up. And each of us have this case. We have an architect, we have an engineer. And so the architect and myself, uh, we started to go into communities and said, look, if you don't have a building, would you like one? And I said, well, um, yeah, we would love to have one. We never had that chance. And anything we did get, the government would say, this is what you got, that's the end of it. And they would give us this building, which was not appropriate to what we needed. So we started sitting down with them and saying, okay, do you want, what's your bucket list? And uh, that's when they started to, they looked at this real funny at first and they said, what the hell is a, a bucket list? So we started to talk about it. And now they really understand it very well and say, yep, uh, this is what we need. And now we're designing learning centers. The learning centers now are morphed into community centers. And what we've is now morphed into, we know that the communities that we go into, there needs to be capacity building. There needs to be the opportunity for members of that community to be trained in the trades. So what we're doing now is we're going to train them in the trades, carpentry, uh, electrical, plumbing, all of those, roofing, we're going to train them in that so they can build their own learning centers. And from that, once they build their learning center, and we will be building alongside them, we'll have volunteer teams mentor them, but also be a part of the building. But what we'll have is then what we, we will come back, back to them and saying, okay, we've taught you how to do this. We've got you these trades. Now, We'll sit down with you and design your own homes because to tell you the truth, the homes that they've got are absolutely deplorable. And <coughs> they're a cookie cutter. I can tell you quite safely to say that uh, they get full of mold because of the weather. They're not suited to what, where they are and what not built really to code. And so what we said to them, We'll design the buildings. They will be built to code. They will be the safest and the warmest homes in British Columbia. And we'll show you how to do that. And so that's how this project has, has morphed along. To the point now, we've, we're uh, set to start, um, and we have a global grant in process so that we can have our very first joint um, Rotary private enterprise campus where we're going to have members of First Nation communities throughout British Columbia come to our campus, which is up in a, <coughs> a little place called Ariski <coughs> Creek, which is near where we had our very first library. And it would be one where they would stay on campus, that we're going to build homes there that they'll use as dormitories. We're going to remodel a school that they got for a dollar and remodel that so that they will be able to learn how to build prefabbed homes so that they can deconstruct and take them to their own communities and put them back together again. We're gonna show them how to mill the lumber we're using a portable mill, how to dry kiln their wood, so we're going to give them more uh, of the trades than you can imagine. And we know that with all this knowledge that they're going to be able to build their own homes without any problems at all and build things as well and get jobs. And that's the main thing. So out of a little conversation between two people in the car in 2007 on the way to Whistler, we've morphed into something that has got even bigger than we ever thought it would ever get to. Um, where are we going now? Northeast British Columbia, up into the Peace River area. Um, we've got many communities up there are reaching out to us. On Monday, I'm back to Williams Lake to open up a building that, that we supported and, and remodeled with our architect right next to our library. And then we're going to do a, what we call an Imagineering session with the, uh, the uh, building, the old school, where we're going to put the campus. Uh, that 
Now, Imagineering sessions are one, uh, just amazing, where everybody gets together, throw out ideas. Our architect, Scott, puts it down on paper. At the end of three or four hours, he'll hold it up and says, is this what you want? And I tell you what, nine times out of ten, it's, it'll be, my God, that's exactly what we want. And then off we go, and there is a big step. We have to find funding, but there is a, a few steps that we're doing here. Uh, to enhance what we're doing. Um, one of the things we've done is stayed away from government. The reason why we've done that is, my friend and chemist will know it very well, that um, the uh, uh, bureaucracy just about kills you. It's not good. <coughs> so we, we stay away from them. And the reason is, we can make a decision very quickly about what we need to do. We don't have to go up 15 lines or 15 different levels to get permission to do it. And that's what I like about Rotary, is what is it, can we do it, get her done? That's it, it's a very simple process. And that's the it's way wonderful. we've lived by on this project. And to tell you the truth, I just got a email today from a gal in Alberta and she's looking after the northern, the northern part of Alberta. Many, many isolated communities there and said, Bob, we need your help. When you can come out and show us how you can do this. We want to do it. And that's what has happened along the way that we're now paying it forward. And it's just like a Chinook wind coming in from the west that we're slowly going across. But you know who's leading this? It's Rotary. It's not the government. They've come to me and said, look, um, you know, we can help you out. I said, well, um, which way are we going to go here? Is it with your ministry or with the minister? And interesting mm -hmm. enough, it says, no, it's with the minister. Now we can do something. The other interesting point is this. We in Rotary have infiltrated many, many, many areas of the world. And here's a classic example the key policy advisor to the Minister of Indigenous Services is a young maiden from Manitoba. She was a youth exchange student and a rotor actor and now Rotarian. I rest my case. Everything else from there makes it go forward even further. So yeah, we, we're slowly but surely going forward. Um, we're one of, our team is one of putting our heads down and just going for it um, and we're we invite Rotarians if they're to come out with us because it, it, you got to see what we're seeing all the time and um, you know like going into Clint too uh, that's an interesting spot we've got a, a major project going up in Cayuca which is on the northwest side of Vancouver Island a K Y U Q U O T, Cayuca. Uh, you can get it on Google Maps and you'll see exactly where it is. And we're working with them, these people, in 1934, were moved off an island that they were living on. The government said, no, you're not living there, you're going over here, which they did on the day. But at the same time, they burned down their homes and the big house. And big house to First Nation is very, very, very culturally sensitive to them. So they lost their big. When we went up there two years ago, <coughs> just to talk about a library, we never knew that we would be part of a planning process to build a new big house, get the money to do that, but also to build a multiplex that we've been very proud of the design. And along the way, we've had these partners come along and say to us, look, Bob, we, we really like what Right to Read is doing and Rotary, we want to help. Well, the Coast Guard is a classic example of that. They're taking us everywhere using any of their equipment that will get us in there. We were just up on the helicopter to Cayuca and really, really helps us out a lot. <coughs> so this building, the big house, uh, the community and, uh, and our building team, which we're a part of, we put in for a grant. And that was uh, given to us 
uh, approved for us three weeks ago before convention. And that was for $3 million. And that's what we're starting to work on now. Wow. It's been an amazing project and one that, that uh, we, uh, where we are and then my team, um, each one of the team, uh, they just do what needs to be done. I just don't have to say very much to them. They're always there. That's we incredible. Put together. <coughs> Sorry. Bob, that, that's truly incredible. I really appreciate you sharing all of that information. It sounds like your team is doing so much good for the First Nations people uh, in Canada, uh, which is really great. Um, are there plans to um, expand further east um, with the work that you guys are doing, or are you guys planning on staying predominantly um, in the BC? Uh, unfortunately, we've been the best kept secret in Rotary. Um, not very pe many people got to know about who in the heck is this right to read. A lot of people don't realize it's, it's Rotary and even Rotary doesn't realize it's Rotary. <laughs> it, it's, it's really interesting. Um, the responses that we've got and once people know exactly what we've done, then they, then it's, oh, the light goes on many Rotarians out with us because we feel that they need to see what we're seeing and it's had amazing effect and you you know that yourself maybe with have done um it, it's it tells a story it, you know like a picture is worth a thousand words absolutely um no we're not uh we're sharing we're sharing this this is to be shared uh, and that's what i said back in convention i said look this, we don't own the rights to this. We'll just show you a template that is working, that we feel that we're starting to hit what needed to be done years ago, and now we're starting to get some recognition with government, but we have to be very careful with that. That's really great. Um, I'm going to pass the uh, mic to Cecilia. Uh, I think is she has a question. Is food security an issue in those cases? <laughs> Sorry. Is, is food security an issue in those, those communities? Oh God, yes. Um, i tell you uh, what happens is that majority of the food that the folks have there is processed. And you know that processed foods can yes. cause diabetes. My diabetes and health situations in, in my communities, our communities, is not good. And, but we're seeing some positive stuff. That, that there are some younger people in the communities. And I can tell you one of them we've supported is Bella Bella. If you don't know where Bella Bella is, you may remember that uh, tug, that US tug that sunk and spread oil all over the place. This is Bella Bella. A very progressive uh, community on an island by itself north of Vancouver Island. And they are growing their own fresh vegetables. And they're looking at ways to, okay, how can we, uh, during the winter, uh, you know, like a greenhouse as such, to keep getting fresh vegetables into the community. And it's a slow process. And I've been into some communities that, that had a, a, uh, uh, a growing, thing, you know, like the glass house and that. I said, hey, you know, you've got a hot house here. That's great. I said, yeah, but the people don't use it because they're not used to having this happen and they need to have these memories to keep reminding them. I'll give you a good point. Uh, I was talking to one of my, my community people uh, in, a, in a place called Rivers Inlet and if you go on Google Rivers Inlet you'll find out where that is too and it's way up, uh, it's not, well it's, it's very isolated, the only way you can get in is by float plane and I was talking to my very good friend there. We have a little library there. And I said to him, Pete, how's it going? And he's got diabetes, already lost one of his legs. And he's such a nice gentleman. And he said, ah, oh, Bob, it's, it, my health is, you know, it's okay. Like this, he does, he just puts up with a lot. But he said, uh, yeah, he said, uh, hang on a minute. I've got to go to my friend. I said, what do you mean? 
He said, yeah, I bake breads, pies, cakes, everything. <laughs> I've become the baker for the community and I made 1200 bucks last month. I said, that's brilliant. Well, my aunt said, Scott, now in our, in our designs, each one of our designs, by the way, has a commercial com kitchen in them. The reason is the folks in these communities always have community meetings, community dinners, potlatches, powwows, everything. And you know, the food is, is this great, a great draw for people to get together, you know, everything around food. And so I said to him, Scotty, can we put a, what we need for a bakery inside one of our kitchens? He said, oh yeah, that's not a problem. We just do this, do that, and we're done. I said, well, all I need to get is a Rotary Club to say, yeah, we'll be part of a bakery for Rivers Inlet. So they've got their own Cobb's bread or whatever. And then they get fresh bread because right now they get nothing that's fresh. It's always two or three days, days old. <coughs> Thanks for sharing. Um, is apologies, Roger. So we're just running out of time for this recording. So I do have to... Um, start wrapping things up. I want to thank everyone so much for watching our program this week and thank Bob for his time. Um, Bob, as our normal occurrence is to pass it to our speaker for the last words. Um, so Bob, do you have anything to say to just kind of conclude the session? Um, yeah, you know, Rogers brought up some really good things that have been out there for a long time within the Canadian community and things are changing rapidly and we've got to recognize our First Nation folks for this. Um, we are realizing that we've got to help them out, work with them to get better education, getting them to read in the first place and many of them cannot, like I said, read and I think we're on track with that given the all the other political uh, throws that are happening, we we try and we stay away from that. We just keep plowing ahead, doing what we need to do. And w those observations that I made and, and I said, I knew that somebody you know along the line would say, hey, hang on a minute. And I respect that. And I respect what Roger's saying, but I can't agree with it. And that's where I'm coming from. And I really appreciate being uh, on Speak to Your Folks and meeting up with uh, data back in um, in Toronto. Perfect. Well, Bob, thank you again for speaking to our club. Uh, you've joined us for um, our week this week in our program for the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. Thank you guys for watching and be sure to leave a comment at the bottom of this meeting page and let us know what you thought about the meeting. But if you have any questions for Bob, feel free to post it there. Uh, we'll look forward to hopefully seeing you next week for our program next week. Thank you, everyone. Take care.